thanks for inviting me. Um, it's a great opportunity. Um, yeah, my name is Robin, and um, today I'll give a talk on uh, a technique that we recently developed in our research lab, uh, which is able to generate high resolution images with transformers or how to tame transformers for high resolution image synthesis. And um, this talk is mostly based on a paper that I and my uh, two collaborators, Patrick and Björn, recently published, which is called Taming Transformers for High Resolution Image Synthesis. Um, we are a or part of a computer vision research group at the University of Heidelberg in Germany. And before I jump into this paper, I would like to give a brief overview on generative deep learning um, in general and provide some more context than what is given in the paper. And I will finish the talk with some insights that we had during the development of the method. All right, so whenever we want to generate or synthesize um, images with neural networks, we're talking about a field of machine learning that um, is called generative deep learning or generative modeling. And the goal of generative modeling is to approximate or to learn um, the generating distribution of some data. So for example, images, audio, text, whatever you like. And we do this by observing samples from a given subset of uh, this distribution, which is our data set. Uh, and in this talk, I will always assume that we are actually dealing with images, but um, the statements also apply for other forms of data. And after training such a model, uh, we would like to be able to sample from the learned distribution. For example, if we have a data set that consists of images of dogs, we would expect to synthesize a new image of a dog, which is not in the training data, um, but still looks like a dog. And additionally, we would also like to assess the likelihood of some uh, previously unseen new data. So we would like to pro provide a new input to the model, and then it gives us um, the density that corresponds to it. Um, another thing that when we're generating a sample is that it's often desirable that we gain additional control over this process. Uh, which means that we do not simply want to sample any output, but uh, we want to specify certain aspects of what we synthesize and then leave the rest to the model. And this uh, can be achieved through what is called conditional generative modeling, where we learn the distribution um, of the data conditioned on this additional information that we give. And the standard example for this is class conditional image synthesis where we control the synthesis process by some abstract label that we give to the model. So for example, um, I could train a generative model on the image in the data set and then tell it to synthesize images of a blue bird or of uh, a terrier or of my favorite ImageNet class, a plate of spaghetti. And uh, yeah, that's what we get. This are actually samples from the model that we trained. Um, all right, but um, there are many different ways on how we can actually train such a model and they all have different trade-offs, uh, advantages and disadvantages. And yeah, I would like, like to give a brief overview of the most um, important variants of generative models now. Um, and one method that has been around for quite a while is the variational autoencoder. And the variational autoencoder can be interpreted as a regularized autoencoder. Uh, which on the one hand has to do the classic autoencoder reconstruction task, uh, that is take the input, uh, produce a latent representation of it, and then um, reconstruct the input from this latent representation. But on the other hand, the latent representation is regularized towards some prior distribution that we impose on the model. And uh, variational autoencoders have uh, the advantage that they're usually pretty fast and they provide an explicit latent variable but disadvantages are that we cannot directly um, maximize the log likelihood of the data but only a lower bound to it and empirically the trade-off between the two terms the reconstruction and the prior matching is somewhat hard to control all right um 
Another class of models uh, for generative um, deep learning are normalizing flows. Normalizing flows are based on diffeomorphisms where we um, parameterize some invertible, invertible function with the deep um, neural network and this invertible function maps the data to some latent space or to some represent uh, distribution that we um, that we impose on a model, a prior distribution, like a, like a normal distribution. Um, and yeah, they have um, multiple advantages. So due to their invertibility, they provide an um, exact reconstruction, which means they don't have to straight off like VAEs. Um, only thing they have to do is this uh, prior matching task. Uh, they also provide a latent variable and they can be trained by the change of variables formula um, for an exact likelihood. And we can then always, um, after training, always get an exact likelihood when we evaluate the model. Um, but this advantage is clearly that the, um, that the network, which parameterizes the diffeomorphism, needs to be invertible. And because the input and output dimensions have to be equal, it's pretty expensive uh, to apply in high dimensional spaces such as images. Then there are score-based methods. They do not try to directly maximize the like, uh, likelihood or log likelihood of the data, but rather the gradients of that. That's called the score. And the advantage is that the score um, network, which which tries to approximate this um, gradient of the log likelihood can be basically any architecture. This is a contrast to the normalizing flows. Um, so this can be as expressive as you wish. And they provided, uh, or there are some really promising results um, for image synthesis recently. Um, but that's a pretty new field that's developing. Um, so that, yeah. Uh, that's something that uh, one should probably look into if one is interested in generative models. Um, then, of course, there are GANs. Um, GANs do not explicitly give a likelihood, by it, but they are trained implicitly to um, to mimic the data distribution. And this is done by a minimax game between a discriminator and a generator, where the generator takes in a latent variable, um, Z, and produces or yeah, produces an output which should look like an example from the data distribution. And the discriminator then tries to distinguish the real from the fake data. They have the advantage that they are pretty fast, that they achieve among the highest quality, at least for um, image synthesis. But a clear disadvantage is, is that they have this implicit density only. We cannot um, easily evaluate the log likelihood which also makes it pretty hard to compare them to other likelihood-based models um, when we have to rely on some external scores like FID scores or something like that. And something that also often comes up when we're talking about GANs is um, the issue of mode collapse, which means that GANs tend to ignore certain modes of the data distribution and then only focus on, on certain selected other modes. And which means that when we synthesize from the model, these ignored mo modes will never be um, will never be represented or never be sampled actually. And the last class of um, of generative models I would like to explain um, are autoregressive models. And autoregressive models factorize the the like the density into a conditional, a product of conditional um, densities. And this is pretty nice because it gives us exact likelihoods. Um, models trained with this objective also had very good results uh, recently. Disadvantage of this method, however, is that um, we have no latent variable. And during inference, the models are pretty slow because we have to generate um, the sequence um, like element by element and cannot easily uh, parallelize it. But so our work is kind of an intersection between autoregressive models and GANs. And yeah, I will explain that in a second. Um, 
But let's talk about um, other regressive generative models a little bit more because they have been quite popular and this is also where transformers have been applied recently. So um, for language modeling, for example, probably everybody knows GPT-2 and GPT-3, which have been scaled up to 170 billion parameters and achieve, um, so GPT-3 achieves impressive results in zero shot transfer. Um, then autoregressive models are also among the best for um, audio or music generation. For example, WaveNet or Jukebox. Um, here's an illustration of WaveNet, which introduced something that is called dilated convolution to model the autoregressive uh, process. And then for images, there are also some interesting and very good performing autoregressive models. Uh, for example, the Pixel CNN family, um, which was used in the VQVAE 1 and VQVAE 2 uh, models, and then very recently published by OpenAI, which some of you also might have seen, the DALI model, which is a text to image model. So it takes in um, a text prompt and then generates an image corresponding to that. And this is actually extremely similar to our method. and it came out like two weeks later. Um, uh, so yeah, there, there is a lot of overlap if you if you look um, at, the, at the method actually. Um, but this model was very, very impressive in terms of semantic understanding. So for example, for this uh, text prompt here, which is taken from the blog post, uh, we have to prompt an armchair in the shape of an avocado and then the model actually generates uh, an armchair in the shape of an avocado, which is cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so why are these likelihoods so popular or autoregressive likelihood models so popular and why are they so successful? Um, as I already mentioned, they offer an exact likelihood, which makes models um, explicitly comparable, which also might lead uh, to more rapid development because it's more easy to compare different architectural tweaks or um, whatever. Uh, but the most important aspect, I think, is that they cover the whole distribution. They do not have this mode dropping issue that GANs typically have. Um, so when we sample from the model, we expect to get quite diverse results. Um, but a problem or challenge um, that we have when we want to train a autoregressive likelihood model is that we need a suitable uh, representation on which we train it actually so for language um, or text this is pretty pretty easy because language is such a condensed representation um, so which makes it which makes it rather easy to train an autoregressive um, model on it but let's say for images uh, which are very high dimensional um, and are represented in pixel space, uh, one needs to really think about getting a good representation because autoregressive uh, models which are trained in pixel space tend to uh, get lost in the details. There's some work which evaluates um, exactly that problem. Um, yeah, but these methods that I just presented, uh, so GPT-2, 3, um, Jukebox, and DALI, they already introduced transformers to this autoregressive uh, paradigm. So let's talk about transformers a little bit. Um, the question is, what, what makes this architecture actually so special and so performant? Um, uh, as you all probably know, the key feature of the transformer is uh, what is called the attention mechanism. And in a nutshell, the attention mechanism is a very expressive and efficient way to induce a global operation on some input sequence by weighting learned representations of the sequence elements depending on all other sequence elements. And this means that it can model global and long-range interactions, which is in contrast to, for example, uh, convolutional neural networks, which are local in their nature. But uh, this expressivity also has its price because attending to every other sequence element means that the mechanism in its basic form, like the dot product attention, is quadratic in complexity, 
which then means that it is pretty difficult to scale the mechanism to very long sequences, such as high dimensional images. Um, yeah, so what the transformer architecture does not, of course, not only consist of uh, the attention layer, but is uh, built for multiple uh, transformer blocks and where each transformer block consists of layer normalization, multi-head self-attention, again, layer normalization, and then a position-wise multi-layer perceptron. And if we are training the model um, autoregressively, then we have to mask the non-causal elements. And also we have to project the final output of the transformer to logits, which then parameterize the conditional uh, categorical distribution uh, in the auto request factorization of the data likelihood. So besides the quadratic uh, complexity of the transformer, I already discussed the fact that auto regressive likelihood models do not really like to work with high dimensional data such as um, images. So we have two reasons uh, why we have to think about getting a suitable representation of, um, of images when we want to apply autoregressive transformers as generative models. And yeah, this is also um, why previous methods that actually apply transformers for autoregressive image synthesis, like the image transformer from 2018 and image GPT from last year, were um, restricted to rather low resolution images of, I think, maximum resolution 64 by 64 pixels or 128 by 128, and still they had to invest, especially image GPT, massive amounts of resources. All right, so this uh, finally brings us to to the method that we present in our paper, which is uh, which is uh, WeQGAN. So um, the main idea is that inspired by discrete representation learning through vector quantized um, through vector quantized auto encoder we learn a vector quantized gan so to speak so um, how does this vector quantized auto encoder actually work um, what we what we have are um, a cnn based encoder and a cnn based decoder and a code book a a codebook of fixed size with um, vectors that also can be learned. And what we then do is, given an input image, we um, we uh, process it with the encoder, get a latent continuous representation, and then quantize it through a quantization operation by finding the closest codebook entries. And then we decode this discrete representation with the decoder and um, have the reconstructed image. And this, so this is not a new method. This is, as I said, the vector quantized auto encoder. Um, and this is then mainly driven by reconstruction loss. And um, yeah, maybe one, one thing to talk about is that the uh, gradient through this discrete uh, quantization operation is estimated by a so-called straight through estimator which means that we simply copy the gradients from the decoder to the encoder. Um, this, yeah, in PyTorch code, this is uh, actually extremely simple to implement. It's just a um, identity operation in the forward pass and in the backward pass, we then get uh, gradients from the continuous code uh, ZE here. Um, so, and then given this discrete representation, we could unroll it to obtain a discrete sequence of these codebook entries on which we then can uh, train a transformer. This means that the sequence has the length um, small h times small w. Um, and so we immediately see that this product has to be small to have a feasible transformer, actually. Um, yeah, this is where the, the adversarial training really becomes important because we, when we when we first uh, started to train these methods, we were training on a single GPU, and so we had to really reduce the sequence length um, to kind of fit the expensive transformer on the one GPU, and this is why we added the discriminator, and then the 
the small representation, the strong compression, the strongly compressed representations um, gave a pretty realistic reconstruction. So, um, so what do we actually do here? Um, we take the standard variational um, vector contrast variational order encoder and then augment it by this adversarial objective. This means that the total loss is uh, has to be formulated as an adversarial objective, um, where the one part is the standard VQBAE objective, where we replace the reconstruct. So in the standard case, the reconstruction loss is a often a L1 or L2 loss, and we also replace this by perceptual loss because this also improves the performance and gives stronger compression. But then most importantly, we add this um, adversarial loss in terms of a patchwise discriminator to it. And equipped with that model, um, so we first train this, this model, there's no transformer yet. And after training this, what we call VQGAN, um, we can then train the transformer on the discrete representation learned by this model. Uh, yeah, but before we look at results that we actually obtained when we added the transformer and got a proper generative model, let's look at what this um, adversarial objective actually achieves. Um, and here we compare different um, vector quantized models, say, so different VQGAN uh, models and also the first stage model, the VQVAE of the DALI model that I already talked about. This was the text to image model published by OpenAI. Um, and the VQGAN actually does um, 16 times down sampling, which means that an image of size 256 by 256 pixels will be represented as 16 by 16 latent pixels, so to speak, or latent tokens. Um, and the, um, the, the order encoder of DALI only does eight times down sampling, um, which means that a 256 by 256 image will be represented as 32 by 32 tokens. So, and what we see is, although the compression is much stronger with the Wiki gun, the textures and the reconstructions look way more realistic. Um, so especially here, the texture of the squirrel looks pretty realistic, whereas uh, for the um, for the audio encoder of DALI, which is not trained or not augmented with adversarial training, we still have this rather blurry results. The same also for this image at the, at the bottom here. Um, so how do we actually achieve this? How can the model achieve this? Um, and this becomes evident if you look at uh, local details. So what we see is that because we add this adversarial objective to the um, to the model to the to the to the original objective, uh, we see that we have something that we call local mode collapse. So let's focus, for example, on this paw of the scribble here. Um, and if we now look at the VQGAN, oh, and I didn't mention what what these two different variants of VQGAN actually are. So the um, the one with 16,384. This is a VQGAN with 16 um, with 16 times down sampling and a codebook size of uh, 16,000. And the other is also VQGAN with 16 times down sampling, but a smaller codebook of size 1,024 entries. OK, and so what we see if we focus on, uh, on the PAW is that the reconstruction uh, by the VQGAN is rather freestyle, whereas um, the reconstruction by Dali is blurry, but it's more more faithful. Um, and this also, for example, if you if you look at this pine cone here at, um, in the other image, then we see that Vikiyan simply ignores it and draws some grass, whereas uh, Dali tries to reconstruct it. At least it's still blurry, but it yeah, it's in the image. So we introduce this local mode collapse to allow for realistic reconstructions. Um, but as we will see now, this is a pretty good trade-off if we train a generative model on top of this uh, learned discrete representations. But um, the comparison that I just presented was a little bit unfair because 
the DALI model actually does only a factor of eight downsampling, whereas uh, the VQ gun has factor 16. So if we really want to compare um, or assess the effect of adding this adversarial objective, we have to use the same downsampling factor for both. Um, and this is why we trained our own um, standard v 2 vie with 16 times downsampling, but only an L1 objective. And we see that this really does not work. This is uh, this gives extremely blurry results. And on the other hand, as soon as we add this zero objective and the perceptual loss, the results um, look pretty realistic. They are not one-to-one -one faithful, but um, I would say they are much better than uh, just training with an L1 objective. Um, all right. so. Before we look at the results, maybe one more detail on, um, on how we actually achieve the conditional synthesis that I talked about at the very beginning of the talk. Um, so we can, or we found that this um, mechanism of ours can be pretty easily extended to a generic domain transfer pipeline. Um, which means that uh, given some conditioning information um which we represent spatially uh we learn a another wiki gun um on this conditioning information this can be for example such a segmentation map as this example here or a depth map or other images or whatever you can think of which is um, which has spatial extent and then um, yeah we so we have two different wiki guns and then what we do when we train the domain transfer or the conditional transformer is that we take the representation um, obtained by uh, the conditioning wiki gun and prepend it to the representation of the image wiki gun and then train the transformer on the concatenated sequence um, and have this um, conditional objective here. Um, and maybe this uh, becomes clear when I show some results. Okay, no results yet. Uh, first, uh, the first thing we actually did is that we verified um, that it is actually a reasonable and good idea to use a transformer in the Latin space um, of, of this discrete model. So, for example, in uh, VQBAE and VQBAE2, the model which um, which was used to um, model the distribution of discrete Latin codes was a pixel CNN um, or in the case of the QBA2, a pixel snail model. So this pixel snail model was the previous state of the art um, for this task, but still had some convolutions in, in its architecture. So we compared for um, a lot of uh, different tasks, unconditional um, data, unconditional modeling for different data sets and uh, conditional um, modeling, we compared the negative log likelihood for um, for this pixels name model and for a transformer model. Um, important uh, thing here is that we uh, trained this on the same first stage model, so the same VQ guns. And what we see is that the transformer outperforms um, the pixel snail baseline uh, both when we fix uh, the training time of the transformer to the one of the pixel cell, because pixel cell trains a little bit faster, but especially when we also train the transformer for as many iterations as we train pixel cell, um, we outperform it um, for for every investigated task. Um, yeah, which just shows that the uh, as in all other tasks uh, that that it is if you can afford it, attention is outperforming um, non-attention baselines. All right, so um, let's look at some results. Uh, the first thing that we um, that we did here is depth to image synthesis. So in this case, the conditioning information is a depth map. Um, and yeah, we try to transfer or learn a generative model conditioned on the latent representations of a VQ gun uh, trained on on the depth maps and then synthesize possible images. Um, yeah, this gives quite uh, good looking diverse results. Also for this um, 
crap here. <laughs> um, then the second task uh, was semantic synthesis, where we uh, replaced the depth map by a se semantic segmentation um, map. So these are uh, spatially distributed class labels. Again, we trained a VQ model on this um, on this uh, representation to get a latent representation of the of the um, segmentation masks and of the images, and then use the mechanism that I just described to learn a conditional transformer and then code back into image space with the pre-trained PQ gun. Um, and the most, uh, what I think, satisfying results uh, were achieved on a data set of landscape images that we scraped from Reddit and Flickr. Um, this gives really nice um, synthesis results, but we also compare it to um, other to standard baselines like Spade or Pix to Pix um, on standard benchmarks such as Cobra Stuff and AE20K. And uh, yeah, these are, are actually FID scores where lower is better. So we see that they're pretty um, on par with Spade in this case for both uh, benchmarks. And what's probably the main selling point of, um, of this work is that we also achieved this high resolution synthesis of images larger than um, one megapixel, actually. Um, and here we, the, the, the most satisfying results were again achieved on this, um, on this Flickr data set, on this data set of landscape images. Um, yeah, where we have a uh, large diversity and uh, can sample high quality scenes. Um, how do we do that? actually um because as i said it's pretty important to have a low um a low sequence length uh, so um we did not simply um train the transformer on a much larger sequence but this was mostly an inference trick is um what we did is we used a sliding attention window approach which means that say we well, let's assume that we have an, ha, trained a uh, transformer on this uh, three by three representation, and we actually want to generate a five by five um, representation. So, and um, this can then be done by sliding this three by three window over the five by five frame in an autoregressive fashion, um, which means that we only attempt locally, but for spatially approximately invariant data such as landscape in it, images and especially if we have uh, spatial conditioning information uh, which we do not ma have to mask um, autoregressively because we prepend it to the data representation this works pretty well um, and Patrick actually um, generated a video of this process where you can really see the the sliding window approach in action and see the autoregressive nature of the of the sampling process. You know, just let it play for a while. Okay, we're back at the beginning. Um, yeah. Um, oops. That's the next one. Um, yeah, another task that we um, investigated in this uh, conditional setting is stochastic super resolution, where we, um, where the task is that given a low dimensional image, um, generate a corresponding high dimensional upsampled. Um, a low resolution image generate a high resolution upsampled image. Um, and again, we did this by training a VQ gun on the low resolution images um, and then mapped to the representation of high uh, resolution images. And after training, we can then sample this uh, different um, 
realizations corresponding to the conditioning information here on the left. And a more, um, let's say, artsy application is uh, edge to image transfer. Um, again, the same mechanism, train a VTUGAN on this um, edge info, on a data set uh, of, of edge images, get the latent representation, and then concatenate in the latent space train a transformer. And uh, yeah, this gives this result. Um, so um, I really like them. They do not look uh, that realistic yet, but uh, there's some potential applications, I think. Um, and another task, which is uh, also, I mentioned in the beginning, and which is kind of a standard task when we, when we train uh, large scale generative models is class conditional synthesis, which is often evaluated on ImageNet. Um, and yeah, here we, we really uh, see the benefits of using an autoregressive uh, generative approach. So our um, approach is here in the left hand column. And we see that we have really diverse samples for this class, whereas uh, Big Gun, for example, collapses to a pretty similar output all the time. The same for this, uh, this class here. Yeah. Um, and again, um, we perform on par or even better than uh, previous autoregressive state of the art, which was PQVA E2, and um, kind of similar to Big Gun um, in terms of FID scores on 256 by 256 images in, uh, on the ImageNet dataset. Okay, and another task um, that we investigated was uh, face th synthesis. So, um, yeah, synthesis of human faces, which is also quite popular, um, mostly because it's uh, it's not that difficult than sampling whole image net and one can iterate faster. Um, and what you can see here is um, here. So, so the samples um, on the right. These are actually what we, um, what are our, the full application of our model, but we also did an ablation study here where we um, evaluated the importance of an um, effective codebook. So of a codebook with a lot of context, which means that for the F1 um, case here and the left, we, learned a VQ gun with a downsampling factor of one, which mean, which is basically a k-means uh, with an additional adversarial objective. And we then fixed the, trans the sequence length on which we trained the transformer to be always 16 by 16. Um, so to keep the computational complexity when training the transformer, but evaluating the effect of learning a really strong compression. And what we see is that, um, so this, for, for the F1 case here, this means that we basically train the transformer on 16 by 16 pixels and then generate a 256 by 256 image. And what we see is that um, these are not at all globally coherent. Also, if, if we do one downsampling step um, or um, three downsampling steps, um, then yeah, we see that the, the global coherence improves, but we actually need the full the full image to get the to get the best results. Um, yeah, and again, we also evaluated the method in a quantitative uh, quantitative way, and we see for um, the Celeb A H Q data set we are among the best performing methods. So here are some. Again, via E and flow methods, um, and uh, the same also for FHQ. It's only StyleGAN that's pretty far ahead, but yeah, uh, you're working on it. <laughs> okay, and yeah, I promised that I would provide some insights that we had uh, during the development um, of the method. So, uh, first of all, we were quite surprised by the quality that we achieved um, basically instantaneously. So. We worked a lot with variational order encoders and normalizing flows and training normalizing flows in the left-hand space of a um, of a variational order encoder before, 
And yeah, we were always kind of struggling when we wanted to scale to ImageNet because it was so hard to train with larger dimensionalities. And then we tried this discrete setting with the adversarial loss and the transformer, and then it uh, just instantaneously gave very good results, way better than what we had before. Um, and that was pretty impressive and pretty motivating. Then, um, yeah, another um, important thing is that if you want to apply this method and train um, the VQ gun on some data set um, of your own, then it's really important to train it as long as possible because overfitting is basically never really a problem and the perceptual quality always tends to increase. So it really pays um, off to wait um, until you start training the transformer on the fixed BQ gun. Then um, another thing is that you have to add the discriminator rather late in training. So don't start um, optimization of the VQ GAN with both both the standard VQ objective and the adversarial objective, but rather train with the um, reconstruction loss only in the beginning, and then after some time add the discriminator loss to it. So we would like this. This kind of gives the the rough layout um, after some time, and then the discriminator adds the perceptually important texture to the images. Uh, they're pretty obvious, but maybe it's also worth mentioning is that you have to train the transformer pretty long and um, yeah, um, apply or make use of, of the scaling law theory for transformer models and uh, scaling transformers um, always or kind of always pays off if you don't over overdo it. Um, another nice feature of uh, this method is that uh, temperature and top K or top P can be tuned after training the model. And this is just a nice hyper or are nice hyperparameters to to play with at inference time um, and can give quite diverse results in, in terms of synthesis quality. Um, yeah, and um, more than 16 times downsampling is pretty hard. Um, we achieved it for landscape images, but other than that, it's 16 or maybe you could do something a little bit larger, but uh, yeah, that seems to be somewhat the lower bound. Um, and another interesting fact that we discovered is that positional encodings seem to be enough to distinguish the conditioning from the data. So um, yeah, this is this is a standard thing when training um, autoregressive transformers to add this positional encodings um, to the data, but we do not have to add other special tokens to distinguish conditioning information from actual data information. Um, yeah, maybe it would it would help um, if we do so, uh, but yeah, that might be an interesting ablation study. All right, uh, so that's basically it. Um, thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, maybe if you're interested in it, um, yeah, read <laughs> read our paper. Uh, and also check out our GitHub page where we have um, some pre-trained models and also um, notebooks and the Streamlit demo where you can play with uh, the pre-trained models um, and compare different uh, VQ GAN configurations and different uh, can uh, sample with different transformers. Yeah, and other um, other reads that I would recommend are. Um, there's one on high fidelity generative image compression. This is a paper that was, was at last year's NeurIPS uh, conference. And this uh, mainly evaluates the effect of adding this adversarial objective for discrete representation learning and compares to standard um, compression techniques such as JPEG or other neural neural based compression techniques. So they did not train a proper generative model on top of the representations, but it's still interesting because it's the same direction when you train this uh, first stage compression model. Then a blog post that I can highly recommend is uh, Musings on Typicality, um, which discusses discusses some trade-offs of likelihood-based models um, and some inherent features and things you have to care about when you, when you train and evaluate these models. Uh, then, of course, the papers on uh, the discrete representation learning, also with Gumbel Softmax. 
And one paper that came out pretty recently is uh, generating images with sparse representations. They also um, generate images with a autoregressive transformer model, but they do not use a, a learned uh, first stage or compression model, but rather rely on the a mechanism that is also used in JPEG compression, which is the discrete cosine transform. So this is also something which is pretty interesting and pretty novel. Okay, so that was it. If you have any questions, please uh, let me know. And yeah, thanks again. <laughs>